Hi, friends. Welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I'm talking with a guest about a specific experience in their life, letting us step into their shoes so we can learn better how to love our brothers, sisters, family members, and neighbors. This episode is sponsored by The Good Book Company, publishers of Hoping for Happiness by self-confessed recovering cynic Barnabas Piper, who also happens to be my guest for today. In this book, he helps us to throw off both the unrealistic expectations that end in disappointment and the guilty sense that Christians are not meant to have fun. He shows how having a clear view of the reality of the fall and the promise of redemption frees us to live a life that's grounded, hopeful, and genuinely happy. Pick up a copy of Hoping for Happiness at thegoodbook.com or wherever good books are sold. Support for By Faith is provided by b Publishers, publisher of The Courage to Stand by Russell Moore. Friends, we live in a fearful and cowardly time. We know Bible verses like, do not be afraid, yet so many of us feel anxious and withdrawn, seeking to escape the notice of whatever scares us. The crisis we face is not a crisis of clarity, but a crisis of courage. And yet Jesus told us that we are to stand with courage. In his new book, The Courage to Stand, best-selling and award-winning author Russell Moore calls us to a Christ-empowered courage by pointing the way to real freedom from fear, the way of the cross. That way means integrity through brokenness, community through loneliness, power through weakness, and a future through irrelevance. Pick up your copy of this important book, Courage to Stand by Russell Moore, wherever books are sold. Today, my guest on By Faith is Barnabas Piper. Barnabas shares about his divorce, helping his two daughters navigate his divorce, and most of all, we talk a lot about navigating church as a divorced man. He helps us step into his shoes and into the shoes of our divorced brothers and sisters in the church to understand how we can love and serve them well. Friends, I think this is a needed conversation, and so I can't wait for you to hear what Barnabas has to say. So here, friends, is my conversation with Barnabas Piper. Thanks, Barnabas, for joining me on By Faith. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on with you. Thanks for asking. Yeah, well, a little known fact that I have to say at the very beginning is that you were, do you even remember that you were, I think my acquisitions editor. Yeah, the for acquisitions my, editor for uh, the church, church planning. planning. Yeah, my church very first, yeah. yes, yeah. Very first book and you were at Moody Publishers and you took a chance on me and I was so, that was like the best day ever for me when I got that email saying that y'all were going to publish my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember it. I remember it uh, well and fondly. And uh I felt a lot of um, affinity for that book because it's, you know, it's a unique relationship in a ministry context. And I think it was, it was around the time I had either published or was working on the pastor's kid. And I was like, these are the same kinds of books for an underserved audience who has unique struggles. So I was excited when the approval was like, I didn't make the approval. I made the pitch and then somebody else higher up made the approval. So I was thrilled too. And and, uh, have loved to see that that was the beginning of, you know, a number of books and podcasts and all this stuff. It's been awesome from a distance. Yeah. Well, thanks for pitching it for me and get, you know, I think having somebody who grew up in, in a ministry home, you probably understood more than others. Just there's the, the audience for pastors, wise pastors, pastors, kids. It's they're. I think I would use the word desperate for resources. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And, and, and uh, isolated too. There's a, yeah. you go look around and there's, there's a ton of books for pastors, but the, the people adjacent to the pastor are often kind of, what, ab- what about me? I and know. so you and I, you and I both had that, that exciting privilege of uh, making a contribution to hopefully help people in that, which is, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what the response to your book has been to you personally, but I continue to hear from pastors, kids who are like 50 years old or 15 years old. It's kind of all over the map. So uh, I'm assuming that you hear the same thing with some regularity from people yes. going, just thank you for understanding, if nothing else. Yes. I, I probably hear the most about that book, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but I love it because I love getting to encourage people who are, as you said, adjacent to the pastor. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm about to actually write another book for pastor's wives in general. So I'm excited. Does that, that mean Does that mean that uh, you no longer 
you're no longer a church planter's wife. You're the church the church is old enough that it's it's no longer a church plant. Yes, we made it, Barnabas. Because <laughs> <laughs> I re- I published that book. I mean, we were only five years old when that book came yeah. out, but now we're twelve. Yeah, it's so, been it's been seven or eight years at least. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about you. We've been, (laughs) I feel like I made this about me, but let's talk about you because you're no longer at Moody. Where where are you now? Um, I serve at Emanuel church in Nashville. There was a, there was a six year run between where I was with Lifeway. So I did, Uh uh, I worked for a couple different teams at Lifeway for six years. That's went from Chicago to Nashville. Um, But then just over a year ago, so August of 2019, I joined staff at my church to be uh, the director for community. So overseeing small groups, discipleship groups, et cetera, which, uh, you know, it proves that God has a sense of humor because <laughs> working on staff at a church, I wouldn't say I had sworn it off. I was just doing my best to not do that. Uh-huh. Um, and, and God made it very clear that that was the right next move. And it's been, uh, it's been an amazing year. So have loved it. Love I means the church I was already a member of, yeah. which, I think makes a massive difference because just moving into a position of being able to serve alongside people I already trusted and respected under pastors who were already my pastors, et cetera. Um, But yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah. That's Ray Ortland's church, right? It is. Well, not anymore. Well, yeah, he's, so Ray was the founding pastor and then uh, he retired from the pastor at one month after I started on staff. There's no correlation between those two things for anybody wondering. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, but he, led the church through a pastoral transition to our current pastor, TJ, who had been on staff as well. And it was one of the best pastoral handoffs I'm aware of. And TJ has been, he's hit the ground running, you know, despite COVID and following in the footsteps of somebody like Ray and has done a fantastic job. And, uh, and the church has just kind of clicked along without a hiccup, which has been amazing to see. That's great. Is there anything surprising to you? So, cause so we, we've talked about, you grew up in a ministry home, mm-hmm. you've been adjacent to ministry, <laughs> but now you're in this role. Are you yeah. surprised by anything? Um, yeah, a number of things have been surprising. I think there was a big adjustment moving from the corporate world to church just because the measurements for what makes up like a good week yeah. are, they're not remotely the same. You know, yeah. there's, it's just a, a whole different set of what is success. Um, so getting adjusted to that was, a, was a, as a difference and a surprise. And then I think the, this is both kind of a, a positive and a difficulty, which you will know all about is becoming more aware of all the burdens in the church. Yeah, It's such a privilege to be able to care for so many different people, but also pretty overwhelming to just look around and our church by and large is a really healthy church. So, but people still have so much pain and difficulty and, and ups and downs in their lives. And so I think that has been something is just learning what it looks like to, to trust God in these things that I, you know, I, I was in a position where it was my job to solve problems for a lot of years. You can't really solve people's sin very easily. So, right. or sin that, you know, sin that's being done against them. Right. Uh, so that, that's been a surprise. And then I think the third thing is just the, and this is more personal than it is probably ministry specific, but landing in a place where for the first time in my professional life, I go, oh, I get to do all the things that, that I think God has, has given me the capabilities of doing. I'd always kind of done some of them through work and then found other outlets for others. And now there's a place to kind of bring everything from organizational, strategic, leadership types of things, teaching and writing kinds of things, uh, working in a team context, all of these things in one place. And I go, Oh, it's like, this is, this is why God wanted me to be here. Cause this, he just, it just took 36 years to convince <laughs> me that, that it was for me. Yeah. Well, that's great that you're loving it that much. You also just got married. I did, uh, just almost a month ago as of this recording. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's another reason it's been a great year. Uh, yeah. it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know how do you put into words what it's like to go from not married to married. It's uh, it's amazing and getting you know getting used to it because it's a whole new reality. But it feels so you know normal and easy and right. Um, so Easter of last year, Easter of 2019, uh, I got cornered at church 
by uh, the wife of a friend of mine. And she said, we've never really met before, but you need to meet my sister. And that was kind of her first interaction with me. And just, just she's just, she was very kind, but just wasn't going to let me off the hook. So it was a, it was kind of a forced setup uh-huh. between myself and Lauren. And after about one and a half dates, I was like, yep, I think I needed to meet her. And so we dated and then got engaged in January and married in July. And uh, yeah, 2020 might be terrible for a lot of folks, but it's been a good year for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, did y'all sorry, get to go? Sorry to make others feel bad. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you get to go anywhere on your honeymoon? Or did- We did. Yeah. So we had, to, we had to rearrange our wedding plans quite a bit just because oh, larger yeah. gatherings are frowned upon. Um, And even that ended up being really nice because it was just family and a couple close friends and uh, it was beautiful. And we had a, we had a great ceremony experience. Ray Ortland did the wedding and that, you know, that right there was, was a really special thing. My parents were there, her family was there. Um, And then we were able to go, we went to Mexico, which still is allowing people to travel in, but only like the resort we went to was probably only 25% full, which if you can ever go to a resort that's yeah. only 25% full, I highly recommend it. It's great. Yeah. You never have to wait in line for anything. You don't have to like fight over chairs by the pool, any of it. It's highly recommended. Except maybe the whole COVID thing. Hopefully, I guess yeah, it's I mean, been if, a month If you can now. find a way to do it that's <laughs> non-pandemic related, I right. encourage you to try. Right. Well, you also have two daughters. Can you tell us about your daughters? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, so I have a 14 year old and an 11 year old. So they're, they just started ninth and sixth grades respectively. So high school and middle school, wow. which admittedly is less than awesome given that they don't like get to start, start school. It's sort of a one or two days a week in school, the rest via computer, but, um, yeah, they, they're handling it really well. Uh, such different kids. Um, you know, the oldest is a very oldest child, a type personality kind of walks into a room and is comfortable and owns the room. And the the second child is the free spirited, creative, uh, more sensitive one. Um, and they're both hilarious and they, uh, they're, they just, it's been so fun over the last, I think I enjoy parenting more now than I did yes. when they were, you know, like preschoolers. Yeah. I think some people just resonate with small children. Uh, yeah. I am not one of those people. Yeah. So as they've gotten older and they've grown into like just in, in intellect and sense of humor and yeah. kind of their whole, whole uh, personality has come out. It's gotten even more fun and yes. we get along really well. Like, 87% of the time, which I feel good about. <laughs> so it's kind of a random number, 87%. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Parenting teenagers is, is for me much better than when they were little bitty. So yeah. And, and people keep saying like, oh, teenage girls, that must be really, I don't know. And I don't know, may, maybe they'll turn a corner and be terrible or something. But it, it seems to me that if you just kind of understand that teenagers are insane uh, they're not rational beings a good portion of the time, but but sometimes they're brilliant. And then they feel things really strongly and express things really strongly, sometimes inaccurately. And okay, here we go. Let's, let's yeah. navigate this. And then you just apologize for all the times you lose your patience with them, which yeah. is with some frequency for me. I had to do that yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Well, if people are doing the math, they, they're recognizing that you have been married before and you've experienced right. divorce. So, and that's really what I wanted to bring you on to talk about. I think we as the church need to be able to step into the shoes as we're doing the season on my podcast to understand what that experience is like and how it has impacted you. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to, to go back and just kind of, you know, we're obviously not looking for the juicy details of your divorce, but I would like to know how divorce impacted you and your, and yeah. your daughters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just to, so to give, to give a little bit of the backstory, like you said, without, you know, sharing any, any kind of undue details, especially cause it's multiple people's stories. So I right. you know, to, want to be conscientious of that. Um, uh, my ex-wife and I were married for about 11 and a half years. So we got married uh, just out of college for me and um, had our, had our two daughters, you know, in the first few years of our marriage. So pretty quick. And, uh, then the divorce was finalized in 2016. So it's coming up on four years now. Um, but as is the case for most people who go through divorce, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like one of us woke up one day and said, well, I think we're done. 
it was, you know, it's kind of a long time coming. So there was, there was a handful of years of difficulty, decline, struggle. Um, and ultimately there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of struggles, but ultimately it, it it kind of stemmed from the two of us just going pretty distinctly different spiritual directions. Mm. I'd say the first half of our marriage, I, I had a lot of growing up to do a lot of spiritual refining that God needed to do in my life. And that caused uh, a lot of tension in our marriage as my own failures. The second half of our marriage, um, God used, used those first few years to, to change my direction and really, uh, really change who I was in a lot of ways. But while I was, while I was moving closer and closer in discipleship and following Christ, uh, my ex-wife was struggling and going the other direction. Um, and so that's, that was kind of, that's kind of the big picture flyover. Um, yeah, I think in terms of, in terms of how it's affected me, the obvious, the obvious answer, although I think it probably needs to be expressed is just how much divorce hurts. Um, it's, it's such a common thing and it gets talked about in such neutral terms so often, you know, it's amicable. Well, my divorce was amicable. We have joint custody of the kids. We have, we have a good relationship in terms of how to navigate life, but it still felt like, you know, I just got limbs cut off. You know, you just sort of wake up and you realize, oh, I can't. I can't be that whole, that whole life that I was for more than a decade. Um, and it's not just an inconvenience. It's a, you know, unless you're crazy, you don't get married unless you intended to spend your life with somebody and you intended, like you gave yourself to somebody and then it comes to an end. That's a, it's pretty dissembling. It just sort of brings you to pieces. Um, I think an, another significant thing is, the shame aspect of it, which is tied to identity. Um, you spend any number of years being married to somebody and you just define yourself by that person. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, you are supposed to view yourself in light of this person you're sharing a life with. So every decision, every expression, if you're with somebody else, you're thinking if that person walked into the room, what would they think? Would they be comfortable? Would they laugh? Would they be offended? Like what, what am I doing to, to kind of get their back, honor them, whatever. So that whole identity piece just disappears. Mm -hmm. um, and in the church, there's a moral aspect to it as well. So there's a, I mean, just getting used to saying the phrase I'm divorced is a hard thing to do um, because it feels a little scarlet lettery. Mm -hmm. Um, and I received very little overt like judgment from people. I'm sure there were some people who, who thought negative things, but people don't generally respond ungraciously. But in, inside, it feels like everybody's kind of raising an eyebrow at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that, you know, and that makes it hard to figure out what does it look like to get into community in a church? Because I was also between churches at that point because the church I had been at was one that I went to primarily because she was willing to attend there. And I was kind of, it wouldn't have been my first choice. Um, then when we got divorced, I was like, well, if it wasn't going to be my first choice and I'm not very connected here, I'm going to go find something else. So walking into a new church with two young kids, uh, figuring out how to navigate that's hard. Yeah. And not to mention, you know, that another aspect is just the figuring out how to, how to view the future. Almost all of us live every day with a sense of, we think this is taking us somewhere tomorrow. You know, yeah. we're doing this ministry or this work because it's mm -hmm. taking us somewhere. We're raising our kids in this way because we want them to be this kind of adult and so forth. Well, the whole shape of the future just disappears when the person you're married to disappears as well. Mm -hmm. um, because every vision of the future involved that person. How are we going to raise our kids, graduations, weddings, retirement, whatever it is. And so there's just sort of a fog that exists beyond today. You know, I wake up and I'm like, All right, I just got to handle my business today. What does God want from me today? Because I don't know what God wants from me tomorrow. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds. And so there's, there's that aspect as well. And then I think the last, the last significant way it affects if you have kids is realizing how 
much you bear their burdens. But since you are the divorced parent, you can't go in and tell them everything's going to be okay. And you, you can only apologize so many times and you can't cast blame on the other parent because even if it doesn't even matter where the blame lies, it just doesn't work to go in and be like, well, that person such and such and such. Cause it just, you can't be divisive. Um, so, so you end up just absorbing a lot of their pain, a lot of their tears, a lot of their questions that you can't answer either because you don't know the answer or because it's just not helpful to give the answer. Um, yeah. And there's just, there's an enormous amount of just swallowing the pain of your kids mm-hmm. and taking those blows on your back. Cause you're like, well, I don't, I don't know what else to do here besides just, just keep going. Yeah. It seems like it would add to your pain and grief having to watch your children experience that and know that you can't protect them from that pain. It's a, it's a lot worse than hurting yourself. Uh, as an adult, handling your own stuff is a challenge, but like it's your responsibility. I knew that I needed to handle my own, my, my own heart, my own pain, my own emotions in a way that was as godly, that was mature. I mean, that doesn't mean I was good at it, but I knew that that was, that was what I needed to do. As a parent, though, you're responsible for your kids, but you can't fix your kids and you can't fix their situations and you can't relieve their burdens. And you, can't, you can't remove it. I would have taken it all if I could have, mm-hmm. but they had to go to school. They had to navigate this with friends. They had to you know, move from, from one home to having two homes. And, and they just all of these changes that are, that are a loss for them. And, and it was, it's way worse when they hurt than when I hurt, Mm -hmm. just always. Yeah. Oh, well, I'd also like to, you know, we haven't mentioned, I mean, I think everybody listening might know that you have a very well-known dad or (laughs) (laughs) he was a pastor, John Piper. And so I'm wondering how you, did you experience anything different or, I mean, I guess, you know, you don't know if it would be different, Um, Mm -hmm. but just there's this kind of public consumption of, (laughs) or I would imagine there was, I don't know if there was, but a public consumption of this, or even maybe people using it as a theological debate. How did you navigate all of that? And what did you learn, learn from that experience? Yeah, I sadly was probably well prepared for that because people love to rake my dad over the coals for things. You know, he's just a target from those who don't like him. And so, you know, I have a fair amount of practice over the years of, and he's been a really good example uh, of, of navigating this. And he na- usually navigates it by pretending those people don't exist. And not, not in terms of devaluing them, but just what's the point in engaging this at all? Mm-hmm. I mean, just, I'm here to do something that God asked me to do and I'm gonna keep doing my best at it. And if they wanna argue in the margins, go ahead. Um, and so there is, there's an element of it has to be water off a duck's back. Um, I think there was a couple instances, though, where people made it very personal. Um, when people want to make a theological debate out of it, well, John Piper has said that divorce is always wrong. Well, just generally, I, I don't know if that's exactly true, but he has he said some pointed things about it. Um, I don't care. Like, that's fine. Whatever. If you publish something, people are going. People have a right to to argue about it. But when people become aware of a personal situation that they should, they don't, they wouldn't have otherwise known about. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just because my last name's Piper, there are people who know my situation who yeah. I will never meet, and that's you know, and don't need to. Um, but when those people begin to make personal accusations or more like speculations because they don't know, they don't know anything about the situation. Those things are hard to respond to. Well, it, my initial response, you know, being whatever personality type I get angry before I get hurt or maybe it's the same thing. And so like, I want to fight back and put them in their place and uh, no fruit comes from that. And by God's grace, I avoided doing that to anybody. Um, But it's, it's tough it's tough to be on the receiving end of that simply because you realize how dehumanizing mm-hmm. um, the being in the public eye is and how things like social media, mm-hmm. which I'm not opposed to social media. I'm on it regularly. I enjoy it when it's used well. 
but it, it does take the humanity out of a situation. People become issues. Um, public figures are consumed for entertainment as opposed to, like, I, there's, a, there's a weird sort of entertainment that happens in reveling in somebody else's difficulty. I mean, we've seen, I guess, anytime you, I mean, I remember as a kid going to the grocery store and you see like the tabloids there and they're always reveling in someone's divorce or someone's gained weight or whatever. You know, there's sort of a joy in someone else's misery. Well, that's just social media now, I think. And so there's a touch of that. And yeah, I think, I think we would all do well to realize that there's a whole bunch of stuff we're aware of that we don't have any business being aware of and just learning how to set that aside, yeah. you know? Yeah. That the pain of that family is for them. It's for their church. If it crosses my mind, I'd probably do well to pray for it and just move on. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, I I sometimes think about people who, you know, Amy Patrick comes to mind, Darren Patrick's Mm -hmm. wife. Yeah. She just lost him. And I just think this is, this is not for consumption. This is someone who is a person who is experiencing pain. And when we make it into something more, we compound to that pain for that person so I just have, I just, I, I feel like, I don't, I don't know what that's like, but I feel compassion toward people but like that who have to endure it. I bet you know what it's like more than you realize, because if you're a pastor's wife, there's a, there's a scalable version of this where if you are, you know, if you're the, the leading family of a church, people are more aware of you than they would be of any other woman of your demographic in the church. And so if there's something that is a problem or a crisis or whatever, there's more likelihood to be speculation. Oh, I wonder what's really going on there. Yeah. What happened behind the scenes? What yeah. aren't they telling us? And then just sort of a nosiness into your business, um, which, is, which isn't because they, they want to understand and pray as much as it is just sort of like that, that carnal satisfaction yeah. of like, I just want to know the yeah. dirt. Yeah, I want to know the dirt. Yeah. So let's, let's switch back to talking about shame. You mentioned that feeling like mm-hmm. you have a scarlet letter. I, I'd like for you to be able to speak toward those listening who are divorced, who yeah. they know exactly what you're talking about, specifically in relation to the church. What yeah. would you say, how have you come through that? Or do you still feel that you have that scarlet letter? Or you know, what would you say about shame? Yeah, I, shame, I think... I heard a definition of, of shame that, that I found really helpful, both in, in understanding what it is and then understanding and how to respond. And that is, you know, guilt is saying, uh, I was wrong when I did that. And shame is saying, I am wrong because I did that. Like, I'm, my identity is wrong. And so shame is sort of a, a how you view yourself. Hmm. And at the risk of sounding utterly cliche, the the depth to which you find an identity in Christ is the answer to that shame. Mm-hmm. Because, because if you look at the people who Christ loved overtly, mm-hmm. there's a lot of really shameful people it, for, for any variety of reasons. Um, personality, sexual sin, financial indiscretions, like pick your poison. And these are people who he called to his side and said, you're mine. And I'm not going to let you go. And, and being able to number yourself among those people is the answer. But it's not the answer like, oh, erased that off the whiteboard and it's gone. It's, a, it's kind of a perpetual pushing back. Because shame, shame continues to, to fight its way back in. Yeah. And I think it, it loses strength over time. But, you know, there, there are still times I have to wrestle with that. Um, which is why there has to be an ongoing uh, investment in, in putting yourself in the presence of Jesus because, because shame can't get in there. It just can't. And, and, but if you, if you're distanced from Christ, you're at risk Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, and it finds its way in, in all sorts of ways. You know, it, it finds its way in when you drive by a restaurant where you went for your fifth anniversary or whatever, and oh, now I feel like garbage again. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, and then that needs to be pushed away with something that's presently true and eternally true. And so, and, and that's not, 
I don't want to, I don't want to throw this out there as, you know, kind of the Sunday school. Well, Jesus is the answer because Jesus is the answer to everything as much as, I mean, it, the identity in Christ is it's, it's how you wake up and see yourself when your initial instinct is to wake up and see yourself as, as trash mm-hmm. or as unworthy. I think unworthiness is probably the, the feeling that I felt more than anything. Um, and, and then the risk becomes trying to fill yourself up with worthiness elsewhere. I want to be the best at my job. Well, that, that good, but also that's not going to fill you up. Uh, I want to, it, it increases the temptation to get into relationships, to fill a void instead of something that's healthy and beneficial and honors the Lord and, and, you know, has long-term, uh, you know, kind of a long-term commitment prospect. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's the, that's kind of the ultimate answer to the scarlet letter question, but it is a day to day, sometimes hour to hour thing. And the fresher the divorce is that it's like a minute to minute thing. And some days it's just, it's all the minutes of an entire day. And it might be just like sitting on the floor of your kitchen because you can't go do anything else. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't do that forever, but some days it's all right. Mm -hmm. How else has your faith been impacted or strengthened through what you've walked through? I think people's mercy and grace toward me has been, has been profound. Um, I found my way, I say found, I was shoved through the door of Emmanuel church, um, about six months, six, seven months after getting, after the divorce was finalized. And it was a, I had resisted going there for a while because I knew of it as Ray Ortland's church. Um, which he would be so offended by because he, he did not, he did not ever want to be a figurehead type of person. And in my mind, I was like, I don't want to go to some celebrity pastor's church. That sounds terrible. I'm not going to do that. And so I was at a conference for work in Kansas city and a pastor friend of mine from Texas had lunch with me there and basically said, get over this false notion and stubbornness and get yourself to manual. You won't regret it. He might have used stronger language than that, but it was something to that effect. And, uh, and so I did. And what I encountered there was, was a genuine expression of the gospel towards other people. A sense of this is a place where you can come when things are not right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, and in, it's a context of encountering Christ on an ongoing basis where things will get right whatever that means, um, circumstantially, spiritually, whatever. And it was expressed by people's just non-judgmental kindness and, and investment. Like second Sunday there, some guy who I had never met, who I became friends with, but at the time I didn't even know his name, was just like, hi, I'm Gabe. How can I pray for you? And, and I was so caught off guard that I answered honestly. Um, you know, which I I think my instinct would have been to deflect and be like, well, you know, going through some struggles or something. I was like, well, this is my story, word vomit. And, uh, and, and he, and he prayed for me like right there in the church lobby. And so those, that aspect, which then put me in a context of realizing just the profound, um, value of being in a real church community. Yeah which I had struggled to find for a whole variety of reasons, many of which were my problems, some of which were life circumstances. Um, but a, a church community where, cause I don't know how anybody navigates healing from a divorce without a community of people who alternate between encouraging, praying, demanding that they like step out of their isolation and then occasionally saying, you're not thinking correctly, get your head on straight. Yeah. Um, all of which people did for me, um, all of which kept me aligned in that direction of, of pointed towards Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the, another more, more internal personal thing is just the, uh, the unignorable reality of God's presence because being divorced is really lonely at first. Um, and, and I, I say it first because God, God was kind enough to move me into a community and now a, a marriage where a lot of that, the relational void has been filled in healthy ways. Um, but that's not true for everybody. Mm-hmm. 
and so the the manifest genuine presence of God through his word, through prayer, through um, just the way that he, he would kind of intrude on my thoughts sometimes to remind me of things that I was not remembering is so it, that's the kind of thing that I will be able to look back on and go, well, when I was at that point, God was this kind of present. So why am I doubting his, mm. his presence and his faithfulness now? Um, and that's, and that's, that, that's not true because I did anything special. It's true because that's who God is. And I just was, you know, I was able to kind of throw myself at his mercy. Mm, That's great. I'm wondering, you know, we talk about this, you're not talking about this, like it's done, but Mm -hmm. you know, we, we might have a tendency to think, oh, well now he's remarried and that's, that's (laughs) past him. But but it's not, it's not past you. That's a part of your story. And I'm wondering right. what, what are some of the hidden vulnerabilities that word comes yeah. from Andy Crouch's book, Strong and Weak. I love that, that phrase. What are some of the things that are ongoing vulnerabilities that you have because you've experienced divorce? Yeah, I think, I think at the point where I'm at now, those, those are the hardest things to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's the, um, the sharpest pain is behind me, you know, that amputation, whatever, like I, I, there, there's, I had, there's scars, but those, those things are largely healed. Um, I mentioned earlier, just that, that sense of unworthiness that, that has become in some sense, maybe more potent in moving towards remarriage and now being remarried because, because I think I understand better now than I ever have what marriage is and how marriage can go wrong. And so that sense of, am I going to, am I going to foul this thing up? Mm -hmm. Is, am I, am I good enough for this? Can I, can I succeed at this? Which I don't think is the right way to put it because nobody succeeds at marriage. Um, It's, you know, if a marriage is good, it's, it's God's hand in it, you know, binding two people together. Um, but then also with that comes the, the fragility of pro- projecting things onto my wife that are not her problem, you know, not her failures. So fear of rejection, fear of her leaving, fear of her judging, fear, whatever, those things, which she doesn't do. But because I've experienced some element of those things, my knee-jerk reaction to certain things is, is more um, for fragile that way or sensitive to it or triggered by certain things. And it's not a point of contention, but it is a point of like, I have to, I have to talk through it with her with some regularity of just, especially when, when we were dating and engaged rather trying to handle it on the front end instead of letting it bite me later. Um, I mentioned memories. I think those are things that when, when you've moved to a place of healing and wholeness, especially in remarriage, like you want to be a hundred percent present and invested. So holidays or any special occasion or going out for a date or like having a bonfire in the backyard or whatever, like you want to a hundred percent enjoy those things. And I don't know if it's Satan doing this or what it is, but those are the times when memories make their way back in and they can erode the the joyful experience that you're in, in the moment. Hmm. And so just being aware of that to the point of saying, I I need to resist those things and remember what God has brought me to now. Like this is, this is of God. That is of something else. It's either of the past or it's just a lie or something. Um, And then I think the last one is, is my kids. Um, If I'm still dealing with some of these things as, as an adult who has, the spirit, and you know, I don't want to say I'm spiritually mature, but more spiritually mature than they are, I would I suspect. Um, and a position to handle these things prayerfully, honestly, with somebody else, getting counsel, whatever it is. What's it like for a 14 and 11 year old to navigate these things? And what is my role? Because I don't want to keep dredging things up if things need to settle, but nor do I want to ignore things if they need to be comforted, addressed, encouraged, prayed over. So just the, the kind of underlying hidden pain or difficulty that they have, 
is something that's an ongoing one as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm also wondering, as a the theme that of my, of my podcast this season is in their shoes, and I'm asking everybody this question. It, according to what you've experienced, what is something that you wish that people would ask you? Maybe they're afraid to ask. Maybe they don't know mm-hmm. to ask. Specifically about divorce. Um, I. It's not a specific question as much as sort of a. It's it's sort of a category that people are afraid to address and it's the entire period of life during which you were married. Um, So I was married for 11 and a half years, which is the majority of my adulthood went from post college to my, to my mid thirties. Well, that's a significant chunk of time that people don't know how to ask about, or if it comes up, you know, you say something like ex-wife and there's sort of a, like a, a draw, drawing back by them of like, ooh, that's uh, maybe we won't go there. But that means that, that means I, it's either the burden's either on me to share my story in a way that ignores that whole part of my life. Not necessarily that time period, but like I can only tell the parts that only pertain to me. Um, or, or the burden's on them and they feel very awkward because I'm speaking freely about things. And so I think it is, it's probably a category of question that opened the door to, to that part of life. Cause it's, it's how people are shaped. Mm -hmm. I am who I am today in large part because of 11 and a half years of marriage that no longer exists, Mm -hmm. but people don't know how to talk about that. Yeah. But you don't want anybody coming up and asking you that. Right. No, that's true. Uh, frankly, I don't want anybody come up, coming up and asking about divorce in general. Um, that's, you know, that's just, it's a little weird. But, you know, it, again, in, this is in the context of trust, relationship, yes. friends, those kinds of things. On a, on a broader scale, I think I would want people to, to consider divorce less in, in legal terms, who was at fault, and more in how has this affected you terms. So as people think of, you know, you're getting to know somebody, you learn that they were divorced, questions that center around how has this affected you, like the ones that you've asked, those are really helpful questions, rather than the mindset of who did what. Yeah. Because that, that's just never helpful. It's only helpful in, in context of we're considering somebody to be a church leader where, that, where, where there is a matter of, of sort of qualification. Yes. But in that, that's not the case in most relationships. Right. Most relationships are built around like just two people learning to trust one another, et cetera. And so it doesn't do a lot of good to think of a divorced person in terms of like, they were largely at fault. They were largely the wronged party. I just, I don't find those categories helpful in most contexts. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. Are there other ways that we as brothers and sisters in Christ can love the people in our life who have been divorced or maybe they're, you know, I guess that would be a different question if they're, Mm -hmm. if they're walking through divorce, but what are are some things that we can do to contribute to their inclusion in the church and Mm -hmm. and the healing that God can give them? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are a lot of parallels with, you know, churches that, that make single people feel at home. So single, never been married people. Um, There's there's some parallels there too, because there's a worth and a value in how people are viewed when they're in a non-traditional nuclear family, or they just, they they, they don't have a spouse. And when there are kids involved, it's a complicating factor because they're just, if if you are a single parent or a a part-time parent, so the joint custody thing, um, just understanding that those are variables that really affect people's investment and availability and fatigue um, it's a weird thing, especially when the kids are little to be a hundred percent parent half the time. That's if, if you are, if you're married and have kids, you're always a parent, but there's a, there's a sharing of responsibilities. Yeah. I'm more involved in the parenting at this moment. And then you come home and you're yeah. more involved and so forth. Not so when you're a single parent, you're either a hundred percent of the parent all the time or every other week. And then so like friendships exist every other week, for mm. example. 
okay. availability to be involved in a men's and women's Bible study or small group or whatever might exist every other week. Um, there's just, there's just those kinds of moving pieces. And that's aside from the, the shame and worth aspects, mm-hmm. letting a divorced person know that they're an invaluable part of a church is an invaluable part of a healing process. Mm-hmm. Like they, they matter to this family, you know, their nuclear family blew up, but in this family of God, they, they're a brother, they're a sister, they're an aunt, they're an uncle, they're a mother, they're a father, like they're, they're whatever to, to the other people in this church. And that's, that's, that has to be a church culture thing. Sometimes individuals can make the difference. You know, the, the church as a whole doesn't know what to do, but if two or three people make them feel that way, that's, you know, that's God's, <laughs> that's God's mercy right there. Yes. So I think, um, I think, I think it's that there's the practical, just helping them figure out how to navigate the logistics of life and, you know, what can I do to help or understanding that they'll, they're going to be here sometimes and not other times because yeah. they just can't. Yeah. Um, but then, and then the, the bigger picture, just you matter here. You, you're not, you're not lesser because of what you lost. Mm-hmm. That's really good. Well, just in closing, could you, and you spoke earlier about shame to those who are listening who are divorced, but do you have any other words of, of encouragement, wisdom, or hope that you would offer them? Man, I, I think at the risk of repeating myself, um, I think there's immeasurable value for a divorced person to learn how to see themselves through Jesus's eyes. Um, because every other set of eyes is going to, is going to leave them feeling inadequate in some way. I think that's true for all of us, yeah. but, but when there's a pronounced failure, inadequacy, shame on the front end. And I think that's true for those, like if, if you're divorced and it was all your fault, you know, you blew it, you blew this marriage up. It, it maybe more important for you to see yourself through Jesus eyes. Um, Cause there were those people who he, who he drew to himself too. Like it wasn't just yeah. those people who were sort of bad or who kind of screwed yeah. up. Like it was, it was all the way bad people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I think that's, I think that's it. And I don't know how to do that other than just living in the gospels a lot. Uh, and then Romans eight's a really good place to go yeah. to, but but between those two, just that gives you what you need to keep going. And the rest of the things will shake themselves. I can't make any promises to people about you'll find love again. Your marriage will be restored. Your kids are going to love you. Like, I don't know. I don't know if my kids are going to love me in 10 years. I sure hope so. So far, so good. But, um, but I can tell you that Jesus is going to love you in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you can come to terms with that, It'll be a lot better 10 years than otherwise. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being willing to talk about this to share your story. I, I know that the people listening are encouraged and challenged. So thank you. And yeah, also sure. we haven't talked about writing, but you've written several <laughs> books and I think, you know, I think you have something coming out. Do you have another book coming out? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in what? Five weeks from oh. this recording or so October one. So okay. coming up soon. Yeah. And what's it called? Tell us about it. It's called hoping for happiness. It's, uh, it's a, a look at what are realistic, biblical expectations for happiness in this life. So what is, you know, I, and, it, and it kind of trying to push back against two extremes. There's the people who are very suspicious of happiness as sort of a kind of pitting holiness versus happiness. Yeah. If you're happy, you're, you're, you're very trite and wasting your life. Or the more American just manic pursuit of happiness and and the next experience is the better experience neither of which i see as very biblical yeah. and so just looking at what is it what is it that that the bible says and that we can realistically expect because i i think if god didn't want us to be happy he wouldn't have created things like you know bacon and yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you know uh, mountains and just all these things you look around yeah. you're like this is a beautiful place we should probably enjoy it so happiness is a good thing yeah. but also it never seems to last so what is it that we can expect Ooh, that so that's really good i'm gonna have to read that 
That's the uh, that's the gist. So yeah, hoping for happiness releases October first, but I think it's available on wherever books are sold these days to yeah. to order now. Well, twenty twenty is a good year for you. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of good stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's funny how God lined that up where yeah. everybody says it's the worst year, and I'm like, I don't want to argue with you, but I'm doing okay. I kind of <laughs> like this. Well, congratulations on the marriage and the book coming out. And thank you again for sharing with me, Barnabas. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I hope it's been encouraging to people. Barnabas's new book, Hoping for Happiness, comes out in just a few days on October 1st. In it, he gives us a biblical framework for living a grounded, hopeful, and genuinely happy life. I've linked to it in the show notes so you can order your copy today. Friends, join me next week as I talk with Karen Loritz. Karen has been married to her husband Crawford for almost 50 years. She's raised four kids and now she's loving being a grandmother to her many grandchildren. Oh, and she's also been in ministry with her husband for almost 50 years. So with all that experience in life, I wanted to hear from Karen. What has helped her endure? What are her thoughts as an African-American woman about the big picture of race in this country? And what has she done in marriage to make it almost 50 years? She shares all her wisdom in next week's episode. Until then, have a great week, friends, and keep walking forward by faith.